A sequel is a product that builds off the storylines or themes featured in the previous installment. For a video game, a sequel is a product that also builds off the previous game's mechanics and gameplay. However, a good sequel not only polishes and refines the mechanics and gameplay of the original, but it evolves them. A perfect sequel in my eyes is a game that looks better, plays better, feels better, and tells a better story than the previous. Of course, a perfect sequel doesn't have to be a perfect game, but I think Watch Dogs 2 is pretty close to perfection as everything from the gameplay to the writing has not only been improved, but has been evolved to make it a real gem that was unfortunately passed under people's radar. But why was such a great game looked over? Well, the first Watch Dogs burned us all. When the game was first revealed back in 2012 at E3, it looked really good. Even by today's standards, almost eight years later, it still looks really good. I mean, look at those raindrops, and there's no way that this was running on a base PlayStation 4. And guess what? It wasn't. When the game finally launched, there was a pretty noticeable downgrade. Now, it's not like the game was unrecognizable, but it was clear that there was some manipulation and some strings being pulled behind the curtains of this E3 demonstration. There were all these small changes that added up to the game looking marginally different than the E3 demo. I would go into more detail on this, but this controversial horse has been beaten to death multiple times now, so it's basically just grinding bones. So I'll move on. So let's talk about what the game established and how Watch Dogs 2 improved on it. To give some context, Watch Dogs established a fantastic world where we live in a technology apocalypse scenario, where a new system called CTOS has been implemented in the city of Chicago. CTOS is the Godzilla equivalent of supercomputers, and every piece of information of every person, place, or object is stored within the massive CTOS servers, and everything from people's cars to household appliances can be manipulated through the use of the system. CTOS generally acts as a big brother figure that watches the Chicago citizens every move in order to compile data, such as how likely they are to commit a crime. And this data can lead to people being pre-denied for credit cards or not receiving immediate medical care because they aren't important enough according to the system, and so on. You play as Aiden Pierce, a small-time thug who, after gaining access to the CTOS, becomes much more threatening. Due to a few mistakes Aiden made, he's caught in an attempted assassination, and he survives, but his six-year-old niece isn't as lucky. And struck with guilt, Aiden retreats to a life of vigilanteism. Our story follows Aiden's quest for revenge, and it leads to involvement with the hacker group called DeadSec. And the story goes to some pretty dark moments. You already get the impression from the footage on screen that the game has a very dark aesthetic, with revenge being center stage, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. A lot of people didn't enjoy Aiden as a character in the the first game because he was usually pretty quiet and had a hard exterior, but I, I personally liked it. Sure, it wasn't perfect, but it had a lot of great set pieces and the gameplay itself was pretty good. The writing isn't half bad either, and some of the scenes were pretty fun, such as when Aiden is trying to track down one of his anonymous allies. Bad boy. What? Bad boy, 17. What the fuck, man? The story, while having glimpses of some fun, are often bogged down by far too serious aspects of the story. I think the game was a little too dark considering the subject matter, and the game might have taken itself too seriously at times, but for what it was going for, I think it did a good job. Gameplay in the first Watch Dogs, and more specifically the way you used your hacking abilities to take down your targets, was awesome. You can make an intersection's traffic lights malfunction, leading to a huge pileup in the middle of the street, or even blow up a pipe that was in the street. Pipes on the side of buildings could be destroyed, and even a dude's pacemaker could be used to give him a heart attack. The puzzles weren't anything crazy, but they were fun, and the combat in the game was pretty decent for what it was. Overall, the game was received well by critics and fans, however, due to the controversy of the downgrade, a lot of people felt burned, and so Watch Dogs didn't get as much credit as I think it might have deserved. So whatever, game's bad, the end. But then, Watch Dogs 2, baby! Everything that was kind of bad in the first game was now way cooler, and the stuff that was good in the first game also got the same treatment. The demo for the game looked awesome, and it just kind of came out. Reviews were positive and all, but a lot of people just didn't trust the series after the first game, and I, I really don't blame them. But as a trained Ubisoft monkey, I threw my money at it anyways, and this time I was anything but disappointed. The game stars Marcus Holloway, a member of the group DeadSec from the first game, so no more lone wolf storylines here. Marcus also doesn't have the same revenge boner that Aiden had, but I'll get into that later. The CTOS from the first game in Chicago, after failing due to the influence of Aiden Pierce, has been revamped by the parent company Bloom, and CTOS 2.0 has now been implemented in San Francisco, allowing for even more player influence and control. However, not all is well. The upgraded system isn't perfect, and due to the flawed predictive algorithms of CTOS 2.0, our main character Marcus is charged for a crime he didn't even commit, and as such has a vendetta against the flawed system, which drives him to join the hacktivist group DeadSec from Watch Dogs 1 in order to take down Bloom and CTOS 2.0. The first thing you probably notice about a game is its aesthetic, and despite that word being mean to all hell, these days it's a brutally important aspect of any game, and it's also something I don't talk about enough in these... <clears throat> 
video essays. In the first Watch Dogs, the aesthetics were dark and gloomy and, you know, no fun allowed, but in the second game, the sun shines so much more and the world's more vibrant than ever. The point is everything in Watch Dogs 2 is a laid back and sometimes meta feel to it. The way the characters interact with each other in the hijinks that ensue are also fun and relaxed. Cars somehow fit in with this aesthetic too, with the streets being filled not only with regular cars and all black supercars, but a couple of bright blue buggies and mopeds. The people on the sides of the street all have a fun aura to them, going for runs, getting drunk, and you can even pet the dogs in this game. Haven't you got better things to do? <laughs> The world just feels nice and bright, and even if you're technically doing extremely illegal stuff, the game takes a fun approach to it as if it realizes how goofy a concept such as everything is connected, hack everything could be. Watch Dogs 2 adds a few little bells and whistles to the animations as well as some new animations in general that add to this game's sense of style. Marcus does flips and dives when he's traversing the world, and even his walking animation feels so flippant. Other animations look great too, especially some of the most basic and minuscule ones, like the way Marcus brushes past the other civilians, turning his body. Or when he walks up to a character, he takes his earbuds out, and when the cutscene is over, he puts them back in his ears. Little things like this make the overall presentation of the game so good. And this isn't even mentioning how beautiful the game looks from a technical standpoint. The characters also look good, as they all have this distinct style to them. The characters all look so good, as they have a distinct style to them, and the civilians around town all have realistic outfits based on the weather. Watch Dogs 1, however, had a very different aesthetic, which makes this comparison a little difficult. The gloomy weather and dark tones of the game made it a little boring to look at sometimes. Characters all wore the same dark clothes, and all the cars had very samey design to them, making exploring a little uninteresting at times. The animations were well done, though they felt a little stiff at times as well. Of course, with both games having different animation styles, it's difficult to make a direct comparison, but I do feel as though the animations in the second game feel much more fluid and fun. The way the world expressed itself in the second game compared to the first is one of the biggest ways in which Watch Dogs 2 improves on the original, though while it is important to have a world with expression, it's equally important to allow the player that same freedom of expression. This is done through the customization within the game. The customization in Watch Dogs 1 wasn't great. It consisted of only changing the overall color scheme of your default outfit, and I don't get why they didn't at least let you customize the colors of certain clothing items. Don't get me wrong, his default outfit is fine, but there's no way to properly express yourself in the game aside from maybe having an all black outfit instead of the regular one, or maybe one that's red and white, or blue and yellow. In the sequel, clothing has a variety of options. You can customize your character however you like, ranging from bright pink boxers to our main character's more rugged punk canon appearance. There are sweaters with dogs and cats on them, how there's even a pizza sweater for you to wear. Of course, I'm basic, so I just go with the all black look with some bright mint colored shoes, but there are also suits for those who want to take a more serious and possibly deadly approach to their work. There's just about some Something for everyone. The only issue I have with the customization in this game is the lack of color. What I mean is that you find a really cool hoodie that would complete your outfit, but the colors aren't quite right, or in my case, I found a neat looking jacket, but the undershirt was a light gray when I was looking for more of a black undershirt. The customization would be way cooler if you could just customize what your undershirt color was, or what the laces on your shoes were, or the color of the jacket, maybe something similar to what Saints Row had. This is, however, such a minor criticism, and the customization is still worlds better than the first game, which was just changing the the color of your overall outfit and not the outfit itself. Now we've talked enough about the way the game looks, but how does the second game play compared to the first one? The best way to describe the gameplay in the first installment was that the hacking was second to the third person shooter aspects of the game. Sure, hacking was a tool that could be used, but more often than not, hacking was more of a secondary tool as you almost always had to be in range of your objective to complete it, forcing you to use stealth to take down enemies. And while yes, you could do a lot of this with the hacking, I almost never found myself in a situation where I could complete a mission entirely with stealth. Watch Dogs 2, on the other hand, is the opposite it, as hacking was center stage and is the sole focus of the game. On top of this, there were only a handful of missions that couldn't be completed remotely. Sure, there were some missions and segments that encouraged a more hands-on approach, but it wasn't directly limiting. Almost every move and hacking ability has been brought back again, such as the intersection hack and the pipe bursting hack. However, now there are more abilities, such as the ability to hack a movable scissor lift and cranes. You can also control cars from afar too, causing them to back up into an enemy, running them over, or control an enemy car when in a high-speed chase, causing them to get driven off the road. 
This hack can be further upgraded to allow you to scramble all cars in a specific area, causing chaos in seconds. Robots can also be hacked to be turned off from a distance, and the hacking of a guard's phone, grenade, or earpiece is as satisfying as ever. Robots aren't the only thing you can turn off though, as pretty much any device such as an alarm system can be hacked allowing you to sneak by undetected, and a particular upgrade that allows you to turn off every device in an area is super useful. Furthering this, you can eventually unlock a blackout ability, which appeared in the first game. The hack is pretty self-explanatory as it essentially shuts down all power to an area, and these hacks are actually useful, which is really nice. For example, in one of the later missions in the game, I had to escape a heavily guarded area, and with no options, I blacked out the entire building, allowing me to sneak around easier, and I eventually escaped without a hitch. This blackout ability is called a mass hack, and there are others like it, such as the mass vehicle hack I mentioned earlier. Even something as simple as a fake text can eventually be sent to everyone in an area, allowing you to run by undetected with these mass hacks. It's really hard to not go on about how awesome these hacks are, and there are still some that I haven't even mentioned yet, including the hacks that were present in previous games that have been improved, such as the lifts. In Watch Dogs, the lifts you could hack only went up and down and had a fixed height. Now, in Watch Dogs 2, the lifts can be moved and can be extended at whatever height you want, giving you so much more freedom. And freedom is such a big part of where Watch Dogs 2 shines. There is so much freedom to do whatever you want and complete objectives however you want, and it makes the game so replayable and makes cruising around San Francisco endlessly fun. The hacks are great, but if it's not regulated, then the game could come off as too easy, as you could just run around causing blackouts and jamming communications, but the game has a solution for that. Botnet points are what you consume whenever you using a hack. A hack such as sending a fake text to a phone will only cost one bar, but causing a blackout will cost you eight. The points generate quite quickly and can be refilled faster through hacking certain phones for points. And this botnet system is perfect, as it's not restrictive enough for you to not execute whatever plan you want, but it also prevents you from spam hacking your way out of a situation. There's a phrase used a lot in open world action games these days, which is, play the way you want. This usually means it's either kill people or don't kill people, and that's how the first Watch Dogs was for most portions of the game. Sure, you could hack into cameras to see different angles and maybe blow a couple of fuses to take down as many guards as possible, but if you had to grab something, you still had to walk in yourself and do it. Your options of incapacitating enemies were also very limited, as the opportunities to take them out remotely were delegated to hoping to God an enemy walks over a pipe leading to an easy kill. Watch Dogs 2 evolves your options for handling a mission with the assistance of drones. You get an RC jump that can squeeze into tight spaces and pick up things so you can literally clear a mission without even entering the building yourself. These options are expanded upon once you purchase a quadcopter, and which gives you a bird's eye view wherever you go. For example, there's an early mission where you have to steal information on the whereabouts of a car, and while I could have gone in guns blazing and shot the place up, or maybe even went in with a more quiet melee approach, I decided to use the cameras to scope out the area and open little vents for my RC jumper to waltz in undetected and seal the information for me. This was such a cool feeling as it really let you become this ghost in the machine stealing data without anyone being wise to it. For another level, I ran in myself and took down the guards in the melee attacks, and by the time I left, everyone was on the floor. And even for another one, I went in guns blazing and shot up the place, and in a matter of minutes, I had left pools of bodies everywhere in my trail. The options the game provides you are abundant and enjoyable. There are, of course, some missions that require you to get your hands on something, preventing you from completing the objective with just the RC jumper or drone, but it doesn't stop me from clearing a path with said drone, making my job a lot easier. Going in guns blazing makes the game a basic third person shooter, which in itself is nothing special, but the melee moves have beautiful animations that give so much impact and the sounds are so satisfying. Unfortunately, by the end of the game, the places you'll be breaking into are so well guarded or have such little technology in them that you still might have to go in and get the job done yourself with guns, or what I assume is the non-lethal approach for Marcus, being his melee weapon. For comparison's sake, Aiden's melee weapon was a baton, which was pretty cool and had some neat animations, and at times it was actually really brutal. But Marcus's melee weapon is a pool ball attached to a rope, which in concept seems ridiculous. But when you see the way this thing moves, you realize that not only is this the coolest melee weapon you've probably ever seen in a game, but that's also causing so much brain damage, and Marcus by the end of the game has probably turned at least a thousand government employees into potatoes. Marcus also now has a way of seeing all possible CTOS interactions through a system called NetHack which is essentially detective mode, but for nerds. This system influences gameplay a lot as you have a much easier way of figuring out what your objective is and what CTOS technology you can control to make your job easier, such as hacking a lift that drops down for you to get onto, lifting it up so you can get over the other side of a building. This remedied a common issue in the first game where you were stuck not seeing where everyone was as they were in front of the camera's blind spot, leading to you getting unexpectedly detected. The way you obtain upgrades is a lot different in the first game. In the first game, it was based on strictly EXP, but for Watch Dogs 2, not only can you get upgrade 
points through leveling up and just playing the game, but you can also find them hanging around in guarded areas around the city. These upgrade points are called research points. Certain research keys will be needed on top of the research points to unlock certain upgrades, encouraging exploration and making getting an upgrade more complex, which can on paper feel like a grind, but I promise you it's not. You can earn research points by finding them on the map, but the best way of course to get them is through the main missions and side missions, which this game has a great selection of. The game gives you research points at a good pace too, so you're never feeling under level. I just played normally and had almost all the upgrades by the end of the game, but let's talk about those missions. The first Watch Dogs had some okay set pieces for the levels, and the main missions were pretty fun in some cases, however I can't remember any of the side missions or even if there were any. Watch Dogs 2, however, takes a very different approach to main missions and side missions. Each mission is part of a bigger operation. For example, one of the earlier operations involves stealing a supercar from the set of a sci-fi action movie called Cyber Driver. The operation is split up into multiple missions consisting of sneaking into a movie set to steal the hard drive which stores the information of the car's whereabouts. The next mission involves finding the car and stealing it, and then the final mission in the operation sees you remotely piloting the car in order to gain more followers for Dead Sex Cause. The missions also have a fair bit more variety compared to the first game, whereas the first game saw you stealing information on people and interrogating others. However, in Watch Dogs 2, you still do a lot of data collecting, but they now throw in some more fun stuff like hijacking sci-fi movie cars, raiding a corrupt businessman's apartment, or even leaking Ubisoft's new game. Yes, that is an actual mission in the game. Side mission, but still a mission. Unfortunately, design-wise, a lot of these missions are very similar. They're often broken down to go here, hack X, leave the area, or in some cases just go here, kill X, leave the area. Granted, that's not all the missions, as there are some such as a cyber driver operation in which you do stunts around town in a sci-fi movie car, but a lot of the missions don't go off the beaten path too hard like this. In defense of the game though, I don't know how they could break this formula, but that could be due to my own lack of creativity. Feel free to discuss mission ideas in the comments. I'm curious to see what you guys come up with. I also want to clarify that I don't think the missions aren't fun because the set pieces and the things that they have you do are so cool, but they can be broken down to go here hack X if you really boil it down. Fortunately, the missions have some awesome environments, so the objectives don't get boring. For example, there's a mission where you find out a politician has been using the CTOS to manipulate voting numbers, so in order to make a statement, you blow up the voting polls, which are stored inside a prison. Once you get started, however, Fortunate Sun starts playing, which isn't a huge game changer, but it makes the mission so much more fun and memorable, as the guards are freaking out trying to find out why these polls are exploding for no reason while this epic rock and roll song soundtracks the scenario. The mission often break up the combat and hacking with not only fun dialogue throughout, but with puzzles too. When a system is particularly hard to break into, you might have to solve an environmental puzzle where you use net hack to see a line puzzle where you have to redirect a current to the source you're trying to hack. These puzzles were in the first game, however they were in this boxed area, whereas these puzzles are actually a part of the environment. They start off pretty easy, but as the game goes on they get even harder and harder and more brain racking as they add time limits and currents are shuffled and scrambled every few seconds. The puzzle struck a great balance between being hard enough to make you think, but making them not so hard as to stump you for a long time. These puzzles also don't show up all the time, so they never got annoying for me. Finally, something really cool in the first game was the hacker invasions, which allowed you to invade someone's game and hide within a certain radius for a few minutes to try and steal some EXP and cash. However, invading other players' worlds meant that you could be invaded too, which serves as a good distraction. On top of this, there were races and basic team death matches, though I never really dabbled into these too much. The second game brings a lot of these features back, but adds seamless drop-in co-op. The co-op goes as far as the open world stuff in co-op missions, so you wouldn't be able to complete the main story with a friend, but this is still a huge improvement. Randomly seeing someone on my friends list as I ran around was always kind of cool, and the races, invasions, and deathmatches still make a return, and are as good as ever. Finally, another strong aspect of the game is its writing and story, and oh man, do I love the writing, and I love the characters too, or at least uh, most of them. The story and writing though is a bit of a difficult talking point, mainly because what people like in a story and its writing are heavily subjective, and what some might consider to be poor and cringy might be the stuff I loved, and I'll make it clear right now, I'm no critic. I don't really know what makes an objectively good story or what a textbook definition of good writing is, but I am an expert of what I'd like. With that being said, I'll address the writing of this game first, as that's where my hottest take lies. The writing in the first game, much like the second, was pretty good, though for a different reason. There were a few memorable characters such as Aiden's Fred Jordy, though I don't really remember much about these characters, and even after replaying the game I barely know anything about the characters and their motivations. As for the second game, the writing has been regarded by some as, and I hate this word, 
cringe. I don't like how vague the word cringe is these days as it can be applied to literally anything. Cringing due to an uncomfortable sight, sound, or whatever is when you bend your body or neck or even make like a disgusted, uncomfortable face. The issue with the word cringe is that it's applied in subjective circumstances. I might cringe when seeing someone eat a worm or fuck, even thinking about it makes me cringe, but seeing someone fall wouldn't induce the same reaction. However, for other people, they might find the latter to be 10 times more repulsive. You might even find this video cringe and trust me, sometimes I find my videos a little cringy too, but classifying something as watchdogs writing as cringe is implying that you felt a physically uncomfortable sensation from simply hearing a line that was delivered. For example, take Wesley Impool, an editor for Eurogamer, who wrote an article about Watch Dogs 2 and how he loves the game, but absolutely despises the writing. Before I get further in though, I do want to say that I don't think that Wesley is wrong. I just disagree with his opinion. He's totally entitled to his opinion and you guys are too, so if you disagree, let me know in the comments. Yeah. Anyways, the writing in this game is, how do I put it? It's very gamer. Have you seen the trailer for the new Jimmy Siska movie? No, it's out. Hey, hey, pull it up, no, man. No, no, not on this. For this, we need perfect sound. We need a big screen. We need to be comfy. You're right. We need quiet. Have you seen it yet? No, man. I waited for you. You're the best. Thank you. All right, everybody, we're going to watch the trailer. Shut the fuck up. Shut up. It's filled with a lot of nerdy banter and general angst, but what I like about the writing, specifically the dialogue, is that it's relatable in the sense that the conversations range from laid back banter about where the characters would go on vacation to talking about how pissed they are about the events of the story. I think we're about to earn ourselves a vacation. Are you in? I always wanted to swim with dolphins. No, stingrays. Stingrays would be cool. Oh, no, no, fuck that, dude. Those fuckers killed a crocodile hunter. You can't trust them, Vito. That's your one veto. Dolphins it is. Oh, come on, Marcus. You can't trust them either. How's it coming along, guys? So far, we've vetoed stingrays and orcas. But dolphins are still on the table. Oh, no, they're not. <sighs> Good call on the stingrays. Those killed the crocodile hunter. When I say that the dialogue is relatable, I mean that it's not perfect. It seems like a lot of the lines were improvised, allowing for more realism to come through. And while the characters aren't talking like bumbling idiots, they're also not speaking at a scholarly level. Fix a smart car the space company couldn't? Problem? No, we got this. Hmm. The thing to understand is that all these characters, of which I'll talk more about later, are all outcasts and would have subpar social skills, which would lead to some awkward moments. I could be reaching here, but I truly believe that the dialogue and the weirdness of the characters adds to the characters and the realism of those characters. Sure, Watch Dogs 1 had good dialogue too, but much like the story itself, it took itself a little too seriously at times, and it's okay to try and craft a serious story, but just the idea of hacking makes the story a little goofy. I mean, one of your biggest allies in the game is a character named Bad Boy 17. I also think that there has to be a couple of people who haven't been introduced to the characters of Watch Dogs 2. So if that's the case, then allow me to give you a rundown of the team and what their strengths and weaknesses are. Starting off is our main character, Marcus. He's much more out there than Aiden. Aiden was all business, but Marcus is much more relaxed and less of a blank slate than Aiden. I think the reason why Aiden was so bland was to avoid a very scary term for video games. Ludonarrative dissonance is when the story of a game directly contradicts the mechanics and the gameplay. In the case of Watch Dogs 2, your character and the characters surrounding you are all really good people who seem to have a very clear moral code. I mean, they're starting a hacktivist group bent on freeing the people. Yet Marcus, when controlled by the player, can gun down a small army only to go back to being a moral paragon in the next cutscene. This wasn't as much of an issue in the first Watch Dogs as Aiden was such a blank and cold slate. And I also want to clarify that the Ludo narrative dissonance present within Watch Dogs didn't really ruin any aspect of the story or Marcus as a character for me. This might be an issue for you, and if it is, feel free to explain why in the comments below. Marcus as a character, though, does have some great moments, and his motivations are relatable and easy to get behind. Much like Marcus, the other DeadSec members are just as fun, or at least almost all of them. Satara is the face and voice of the group, or at least the creator of the face and voice. She designs all the DeadSec propaganda and spends her free time tagging billboards and handling the group's social media presence. She plays a vital role in DeadSec's operation, and she conducts the following to do whatever is needed to ensure the success of the mission. Speaking of missions, she opens a line of side missions for you where she teaches Marcus how to tag. And in an attempt to impress her, Marcus does multiple tags around the city, eventually tagging the Golden Gate Bridge. She is definitely the most socially inclined of the group and has a lot of fun interactions with Marcus with a hint of flirting here or there. Next up is Josh, an extremely intelligent and socially awkward hermit who handles all of the software related DedSec affairs. Josh doesn't say much and he's definitely one of the weaker characters as he doesn't really give us much aside from a few humorous awkward lines. But despite that, he is definitely the best hacker within 
and dead second, so he's very useful, and he's responsible for the more complicated matters such as decrypting files and breaking into networks wirelessly. Next up is easily the most controversial of the bunch. Wrench. A lot of people don't like Wrench. I, however, disagree. Wrench is a hardware man working on the gear for the crew, and his character is by far the nerdiest, but I find him to be really fun and entertaining. Plus, that mask looks metal as fuck. Anywho, Wrench's reception is pretty split down the middle with me. Half the people I know love him, and the other half I know hate him. Generally, the factor that splits the two is his dialogue. I think the best way to describe Wrench's dialogue and Wrench's character as a whole is that Wrench is gamer as fuck. He makes pointless conversations about dolphins, and he gets way too into action movies, and even- Oh, okay, now that's a little weird. But I, I love Wrench, and I love his almost cartoonish personality and his antisocial behavior. He's a huge fan of robots and sci-fi, and he's a kind-hearted guy deep down with a slightly alluded to troubled past. I don't remember where I heard this, I don't know if it was in the game or online, but it's speculated that Wrench had a troubled childhood, suffering from child abuse, and because of this, he developed an extremely shy personality, and it's due to this that he made the mask to express his emotions. The story takes him to some interesting places emotionally, emotionally, where his loyalty to the team is tested, and you clearly see that underneath his animated exterior, there is a beaten and broken man. His physical appearance of having an animated sharp exterior is much like his personality just a mask. Since we're on somewhat of a negative note, let's talk about what is easily the worst character in this game, or at least the worst handled character, Horatio. Horatio is the group's coordinator and he establishes what targets to go for next, and that is about all we learn about him. We do eventually learn that he works for Noodle, this game's equivalent to Google, but unfortunately all the targets you go for are decided upon between you, Sitara, Josh, and Wrench, and Horatio doesn't do anything. He doesn't even get any screen time until his character gets... Um, let, let me stop for a second. Throughout this video, I've tried to avoid spoilers with the game and its story to the best of my ability, but I think this next spoiler isn't very meaningful to the game's overall plot, so I will be revealing a spoiler. However, if up to this point you've been thinking you want to get this game, then feel free to skip to this point in the video, okay? Ready? Horatio fucking dies! Now, here's some issues with this. There was only one mission surrounding him before he was killed, and on top of that, he is in almost none of the missions leading up to his death. The game makes it seem like his death is this colossal impact on the team, but the game doesn't stick with it. He just sort of dies and it feels cheap. Nothing is done with his character, and it leaves me wondering why he was in the game at all. What's the point? He feels so tacked on, it seems like the only purpose for his character was just to have someone die. I feel like this idea that he was tacked on last minute is supported by the fact that he wasn't present in a lot of the game's promotional material. Horatio is easily the weakest part of the game, and by far the weakest character, but on the bright side, since he isn't in the game very much, he doesn't drag it down too much. There are some other characters present in the game too that are really cool, but I'll refrain from talking about those guys because they get into more spoiler territory. I don't want to get into those aforementioned spoilers because I don't have much to say about the story as a whole. The story does its job of giving an excuse for the characters to interact in fun situations, which is this game's bread and butter, but aside from that, I don't have much to say about it. Much like the first game, the characters serve their purpose, so I find the characters in the sequel and the overall story in the sequel to be much deeper and well-rounded than the first Watch Dogs. It's not great, but it's not terrible. And there are some really cool surprises and really cool sequences that I won't tell you about in case this video has convinced you to pick up Watch Dogs 2. And that is pretty much all I have to say about it for now. This video is already really long, and I think I've made my point pretty well by now, though if you have any questions, feel free to leave it in the comments below. The gameplay of Watch Dogs was heavily expanded upon in the sequel, making the franchise live up to the tagline of hack everything. The story and aesthetic went in a totally different direction and for the best, because San Francisco is still fun to run around in even years later, with dialogue and characters still being entertaining. The whole point of a sequel is to improve on what came before it, and Watch Dogs and Sequel are a perfect example of this. Hi guys, thanks so much for uh, making it to the end of the video. I just want to clarify that I do think Watch Dogs 1 is a very good game. I just think Watch Dogs 2 is so fucking good. I stream regularly on Twitch, so um, feel free to check that out at twitch.tv slash thatboyaqua. That's on a cross run. Oh shit, I'm reeling in, I'm Too reeling short. in. Are you? Oh shit. <laughs> Let's go. Okay, I can't, I just can't do sharp turns, I guess. And yeah, following me there will be uh, a lot of fun, trust me. You can also join my Discord server. I don't really plug that a lot, but I have one. A link will be in the description. And speaking of links, I'll be in the description. Nam12399 makes really fucking good video essays. And uh, he actually just made one on Catherine, and it's just a really good video. And if you, you know, if you have an hour, you can watch his Persona 3 video, which is like really good. They're, all of his videos are really good. So go check him out. If you want to check out other video essays I've done, I'll have a link to the video essay playlist in the description. And that's about it, guys. I'll uh, see you later.